let's if Stanley's not here. Good evening, I'm Joe Nye, and it's a great pleasure for me to welcome you tonight to hear the Honorable Jean-Claude Trichet. We're very fortunate that uh, Monsieur Trichet is here with us, uh, stopping at Harvard between his uh, visit with the uh, annual meetings of the Interna World Bank and the International Monetary Fund, and is returning to France this evening, back to the Bank of France, where he is the governor and has been since 1993, and uh, we're honored that he is taking this time to spend with us here at Harvard. Uh, Jean-Claude Trichet, as any of you know who read the newspapers, uh, is the man, the driving force behind the Franc Four, the, uh, the strong currency position, which is the position of France in preparation for the 1999 European Monetary Union. Uh, he is also uh, expected to succeed uh, Wim Duesenberg as the second president of the European Central Bank uh, in four years, uh, 2002. He has a long and illustrious career in finance and government, uh, but perhaps from the point of view of Kennedy School students, you should know that uh, he studied economics and graduated for the Institut des Etudes Politiques. Uh, the uh, Institute of uh, Political Studies, but most important, uh, from the École Nationale d'Administration. And that makes him an ANARC, which is the group of people who go into public service and then essentially run France. Uh, Jean-Claude Trichet is, uh, has served as a governor of the World Bank from 93 to 96, and alternate governor for the IMF since 96. He's also a member of the Group of 30, which is the prestigious nonprofit, nonpartisan consultative group on international economic and financial matters. He has numerous decorations. He's a chevalier of the National Order of the Legion of Honor and has numerous foreign decorations as well. Uh, he will speak to us tonight on economic and monetary union seen from the Bank of France. <coughs> Welcome to Harvard. And to the Thank you very much, uh, much uh, Dean Joe Nye. I was very impressed by your presentation, much too flattering. I understand it is la loi du genre. Uh, I'm very, very honored to, be, to have been invited here and it reminds me the story of uh, this uh, academic in France who was invited by a U.S. university to speak on the Euro five years ago. He came in the university. Uh, the speech was supposed to start at 9.30. At 9.30, there was absolutely nobody in the room. Ten minutes later, nobody in the room. Five, uh, Fifteen minutes later, one person entered the room and sat down. So he understood, really, that he could not expect, on this particular subject, a big audience. So he decided to start after 20 minutes with only one person in the audience. He delivered a very nice speech he had prepared carefully. And uh, after having delivered the speech, he was packing everything and getting out. When the guy in the room said, sir, sir, please don't leave, I'm the next speaker. <laughs> Things have changed, obviously. And I'm very happy to see that the Euro now is uh, uh, a likely, uh, likely interesting subject. Uh, uh, and I'm very, very happy that the, the mood has changed, obviously. Uh, let me tell you how I understand why there was so much skepticism five years ago, four years ago, three years ago, two years ago, even one year ago, maybe, in the US, 
and why it could be useful for me and for the European to understand why that skepticism was so strong, because it seems to me that maybe we can draw some lessons from this, this skepticism and see maybe what conditions have to be met for the euro to be a success. The, I would say, four major criticisms that were addressed to the euro and were convincing a lot of observers that the euro will not proceed were the following. The first criticism was, you've put the uh, cart before the horses. You uh, have not got any federal government. You have no federal budget. Therefore, the policy mix on the euro area is likely to be let in the hands of a dozen of governments which would have a random position as regards the fiscal policy. Therefore, the policy mix is very likely to be unbalanced. Second major criticism, you don't have a federal government, you don't have a federal budget, therefore you have absolutely no means to resist through the fiscal channel asymmetric shocks in the euro area. In the US, for instance, if California has big problem, then the spending, the public spendings, federal public spendings in California continue at the same pace, but the tax receipts, the federal tax receipts coming out of California will shrink with the GDP of California, and therefore we'll have an automatic stabilization coming out of the functioning of the federal budget of the United States. You don't have a federal budget in Europe, therefore you, you will not have resistance to asymmetric shocks in Europe, and the euro will not be a success because of that incapacity to resist asymmetric shocks. One of the third major criticism we heard at the time was you, again, are putting the cart before the horses. You don't have the structural reforms that are needed for the euro to be a success. You should have started on the structural reforms all over Europe. Reforms in the field of labor market, in the fields of social security, social protection, in the fields of, uh, in the fields of uh, training and education. And after that, then, you should uh, launch the single currency endeavor, but not before. And again, this is the reason why the euro will not be a success. And the fourth criticism I heard very often was, you ha will have a cost of the transition to the euro, which will be very heavy, because the euro will start from scratch, and starting from scratch, you'll have to demonstrate the credibility of the European Central Bank and of the new currency. And on the other hand, you are in the run-up to the euro embarking on ultra-orthodox fiscal policies, and this will be an additional burden on the euro on top of the fact that you'll have a too orthodox monetary policy. These were I would say the four major criticisms, but I'm absolutely sure that during the sessions on question and answers, I'll have other questions that will prove that my list of potential and possible criticism was not necessarily complete. And I hope very much that they, you will pose a very incisive and, uh, and uh, I would say, uh, direct and indiscreet questions. Now, how can we respond to those criticisms what are the responses that have been given by the Europeans to think that the euro will be a success? The first criticism is obviously perfectly founded if we had not inject in the Maastricht Treaty provisions that are precisely designed to make the functioning of the euro area a correct functioning, even without a fiscal federal uh, policy, even without a federal government. True, we don't have a federal budget. The expenses of the European Union in percentage of GDP at the level of the European Union are at the level of approximately 1.27% 
this is not the appropriate tool to produce a fiscal policy at the level of the area. So we are absolutely bound to consider that the fiscal policy of the euro area is the addition of the fiscal policies that are designed and implemented by all particular uh, nation state member of the European Union. So we have to address directly the fiscal policies at the level of the member states of the Union. In the Maastricht Treaty, it is clearly said that there is a peer surveillance amongst the governments member of the Union of the fiscal policies of the others. If the fiscal policies of the others are deemed inappropriate, there is a system of sanctions starting from public remarks up to uh, ineligibility to the European Investment Bank credit and up to fines, fines that could represent a significant part of the GDP of a particular state. See the difference with the US. In Washington, I'm speaking under the control of our dean, it's not possible for Washington to tell California you're behaving improperly in the fiscal matters. And behaving improperly, you're very likely to create a problem for the United States themselves. It would be considered absolutely out of question. The policy mix goes through the federal budget, not the budget of California. In Europe, it is possible for, from the center of Europe, which is, say, Brussels, to oversimplify, it is possible to say, you're behaving improperly. Because we don't have a federal budget, we are bound to consider that you, in your national policy, have a capacity to pollute the entire area, and therefore we are asking you to redress your policy. In a way, we have offset the absence of federal government in giving more power to the center in the fiscal side on the various members of the Union. And that proves, in my opinion, that the Europeans have not embarked into an ultra-orthodox posture, but that they have responded to the pertinent potential criticism, which was, how would you care for an appropriate policy mix when you have that single currency without having a federal budget? By the way, I have to mention en passant that it is equally untrue to say that these provisions were imposed by some of us and uh, everybody can identify a priori who would qualify to be the ultra-orthodox person in the grouping of countries which are concerned on others. It is not true. The famous 3% threshold that has been introduced as one of the key rules for the fiscal behavior of various nation states was invented in France at the beginning of the 80s, implemented in my country during all the 80s, and I would say nicely introduced in the European fabric when we negotiated the treaty as a simple rule which had proved uh, to be uh, efficient and opportune. Now, the second criticism. Second criticism, you have no resistance to asymmetric shocks through the fiscal channel. There, it is absolutely clear that we don't have the same mechanism that exists, that would exist in a federal organization. The equivalent uh, posture that the European have invented is the following. In the Stability and Growth Pact, which is the implementation of the provision of the Maastricht Treaty as regards fiscal posture, we said, an, in normal times, the target of a particular nation member of the Union should be a budget close to balance or in surplus. That is enshrined in the Stability and Growth Pact that has been underwritten by all members of the Union. Not, nothing to be surprised uh, when you're speaking in front of a, an American audience. You have exactly the same reference 
if I'm not misled, I'm again speaking under the control of our dean in the United States, there is a bipartisan accord to consider that the normal position for a budget is to be close to balance or in surplus. Uh, the summing up is balanced budget. Uh, so we are in the same intellectual universe. But what is obvious is that if a particular European nation has a major asymmetric shock, then it is possible, of course, from the balanced budget position to utilize the automatic stabilizers in this particular nation, certainly up to the 3%, which are the threshold of deficit that you are not supposed to overpass. And uh, if circumstances as are absolutely exceptional, then the peers are judging the situation. Uh, to sum it up uh, with a metaphor which is maybe a little bit too bold, I would say, in the Maastricht Treaty and in the Stability and Growth Pact, we have some kind of automatic reloading of the fiscal gun. We have an automatic reloading of the fiscal gun because we go down to zero in normal times and we can fire several cartridges to offset possible asymmetric shocks. On top of that, of course, I could expand a little bit on the fact that there is also um, possibilities in the European fabric for transfers, uh, cohesion fund, structural funds. And so in the European vision, there is some kind of transfers that are possible as well as in the United States through the Californian example I gave a moment ago. So again, I think that we have not treated with benign neglect that very pertinent question on how do you resist asymmetric shocks. It seems to me that we have treated that problem and we have given a response. Maybe not a response that we, you would judge uh, enthusiastic, but it is a response to the question. Third criticism, the uh, question of structural reforms. There again, it seems to me that the question is pertinent. We have in Europe a, a number of structural impediments which are certainly, certainly the, the reason why we have unemployment at a level which is too high. And the IMF or the OECD and certainly the Banque de France, and it seems to me certainly all other central banks in Europe consider that a very, very important proportion of our unemployment is due to the fact that we have those structural impediments. The IMF or the, well of the, or the OECD do not hesitate to say, well, maybe 75% of unemployment, maybe 80% of unemployment is due to those structural impediments. So we have to redress that. But the question is not whether or not you have to embark into structural reforms. The question is whether the, those structural reforms would be contradictory or complementary with the euro, with the single currency. And there, it seems to me that the European response is, yes, we need structural reforms, but no, there is no contradiction between the single currency and those structural reforms for, for the following reasons. First of all, because it's absolutely clear that the single currency per se is a major structural reform. It is the achievement of the common market and single market endeavor, which has been the vision of the founding fathers. Very easy for me in the US to say, start the, thinking the following uh, thinking experience. You have not here in the Harvard University, the same currency that would exist in California and in Florida, and reflect a little bit on the consequences on the US single market. Now, we are presently in Europe in that position. We don't have the same single currency in the various parts of our own single market, and we are embarking within less than three months in a new phases of the single market with a single currency. And that, again, will change dramatically the functioning of the markets of goods, of services, and of course of capital market all over Europe. So a major structural reform which will certainly play a decisive role 
to induce structural reforms in all the other areas as a natural consequence of the single currency. On top of that, because of the single currency, the European governments have decided to embark into closer coordination and cooperation between them. And that deals with all elements of an economic policy, including structural policies. They decided uh, during the European Council of Luxembourg that they will particularly target closer cooperation in the field of structural policies. And there, it seems to me that it would be very natural that we could have a lot of cross-fertilization all over Europe in those fields that I have listed, labor market functioning, social protection uh, optimization, education and training. And one of the possibility that we saw in the Banque de France when we reflected on that particular element of intensification of the cooperation within Europe was why not fancy that we could reverse the burden of the proof in this area. For instance, if the peers would tell any of them why aren't you introducing in your own country reforms that have been introduced in another country on the basis of a left-wing, right-wing consensus, on the basis of a union and business leaders consensus, and that have proved working. Why not introducing that? Pro demonstrate that it would be inappropriate in your own case, even if it proved to be efficient to counter unemployment, to foster job creation in another country. And take Europe as a whole, each particular country has, in this field of structural reforms, assets and liabilities. We ourselves are good in certain respect and bad in other respects. And it is the same in Italy, the same in Germany. Uh, in the field, I need to quote a, a, a country which would not be my country, in the Netherlands, they have introduced on the basis of what I said, consensus, left wing, right wing, consensus, union leaders and business leaders, elements of reforms, for instance, in the domain of unskilled youth, that have proved to be efficient to foster job creation and reduce unemployment. So that is an example of such possibilities of cross-fertilization all over Europe. It seems to me, again, uh, on this very important matter, which is structural reform, that the single currency will foster structural reform, is fully coherent with structural reforms, and will trigger cross-fertilization. The last criticism I have been listing but certainly the last in your minds, would be the cost of transition. I will not dwell upon the fact that, as I said already, there is no ultra-orthodox fiscal bias in the European Monetary Union fabric. It seems to me that, again, it was the only way we had to offset the fact that we didn't have a federal budget and federal institutions. As regards the monetary policy itself, I will only say that the monetary union and the single currency is not starting from scratch. It is not starting from scratch. It is starting from the solid soil of those currencies and those institutions, those central banks, that have proved in the past that they could accumulate credibility, solidity, and confidence-inspiring posture. And uh, that represents an immense asset for the European Monetary Union. It is not sufficiently known here that at least amongst the euro area, six currencies 
representing two-thirds of the GDP, the consolidated GDP of the euro area, have been totally stable over the last 11 years and a half. That is, in this area of stability, of credibility, of confidence inspiring, that of course you have the lowest interest rates in the area. Namely, if I take the example of my country, 3.3% as regards short-term rates and 3.9% uh, as regards 10 years rates. That's the level, that's the, the, the soil on which we are building a European Monetary Union. And it is perfectly clear that the euro will have the legacy of these currencies and the legacy of the credibility, the accumulation of credibility of these currencies. So euro, the euro is not starting from scratch again. And it seems to me that we can be very confident that the transition to the euro would be a natural one and not an unnatural one. And that this two-third of a GDP that is equivalent to the GDP of the US, a little less, but only a little, the GDP, the consolidated GDP of the 290 million inhabitants of the Euro area represent uh, uh, maybe 5% uh, less than the US GDP. Two thirds of that represents approximately two thirds of the GDP of the US. And what we are doing is to give the third remaining proportion of the GDP of the euro area, I would say, a currency which will have the same quality, the same solidity, and the same confidence-inspiring uh, legacy as the other two-thirds has already accumulated. That is really the way we see it. So, as you see, it seems to me that we can respond to the criticism I have been listed, and we can say that the conditions for the euro to be a success are very easily derived from this explanation I just gave you. For the euro to be a success, we need, of course, a solid and stable currency, confidence-inspiring, which would create a very good financial environment with low market rates all over the area. We need fiscal soundness, we need structural reforms, and we need appropriate handling of the transition, which uh, we are doing right now. We are in the run-up to the euro. Now, I don't want to suggest that I consider that uh, this is an easy task. It will require a lot of judgment, a lot of cooperation, a lot of coordination, and maybe a lot of courage in some cases. No difference at all with any nation state. No difference at all with any federation. Exactly the same. To run appropriately any economy in the world, you need integrity, you need courage when time comes, you need uh, appropriate policy mixes, you need exactly what we need in Europe. The only difference being that our organization does not, I would say, uh, uh, is not inspired by already experienced system. We are really starting with the single currency without a federation, a new concept, but a new coherent concept in my opinion. Now, let me conclude in mentioning the following story, which uh, I experienced very recently. And I'm, I'm embarking on that only because uh, uh, our dean uh, is himself a political man. I was uh, in the office of one of my colleagues recently, and very wisely, he had put uh, just behind him a enormous painting of Saint Sebastian. You know, that person who was uh, dead with a lot of arrows and uh, he was in an absolutely abominable posture. So we were a lot of central bankers. We were looking 
at San Sebastian and we said, yeah, well, it's exactly that. I mean, he, he had exactly got it. I mean, we are all in this position. Uh, it's a very, very terrible job. Uh, we are attacked by everybody responsible for everything and so forth. And then there were a lot uh, of political men which, which were also gathering around and the Minister of Finance came and he, he was meditating in front of the San Sebastian and he said, well, you're probably right, governors. I, I would say that this is exactly what you are enduring. But for political men, it would be only a little bit different. All the arrows would come in the back. Because of the overflow crowd, it may be a little bit difficult to get to them. So if you can speak loudly enough, very loudly, uh, we can perhaps tolerate questions from where you're sitting in your chairs. Minos? Uh, may I ask a, uh, if you will elaborate a little bit on the subject, which of course uh, is very relevant to the audience right here. Uh, if, when the Euro obviously will succeed and will succeed, How will that affect? What effect will have versus the dollar? The dollar today is the predominant reserve asset in the world. And the dollar is used in that capacity by the United States policy to run, for example, these huge trade deficits without worrying how to finance them. They finance them with their own currency. If you introduce today the euro, which is to say the currency of an economic area which is just as big as the United States, how will that play? What, what would the role of the dollar be? Would the United States policy be forced to change? Would it be far more disciplined into their relations with the rest of the world, in their trade policies, for example? Can, you be appropriate to comment on that? can everybody hear that question, or you want a quick? You, you can hear it? Okay, good. I would say that, uh, in my opinion, to understand what we are doing, we have to consider again that the best grid is to see more the continuity than the drastic changes. The euro is in the continuity of the European currencies I've been mentioning. And these currencies had relationship with the US dollar already, and they had that relationship since uh, uh, they exist. And I don't expect dramatic changes the euro was not created to challenge the dollar, in my opinion. The euro was created because it was the best way to achieve the single market, to achieve the endeavor, the vision of the founding fathers. Uh, we will, in my opinion, experience that new system in the continuity of what has been observed in the past, in the past years in particular, and I would only mention two or three things in this respect. First of all, I have experienced myself a period of turbulences when there was disagreements on concepts, which is not the case today. In both sides of the Atlantic, we are sharing the view that a sound fiscal policy is appropriate. In both sides of the Atlantic, we are sharing the view that a sound monetary policy is appropriate and uh, that inflation doesn't solve problems. So it seems to me that sharing the same values, which has not necessarily been the case in the past years, it's, it was not the case at the beginning of the 80s, for instance. It was not the case, uh, it has not been the case always since World War II, but it is the case today and it's been the case over the past years. And so it seems to me that it is the one of the main reasons why we might consider that this relationship would be a, a, a smooth one and will not provoke any erratic uh, uh, posture. I, I have also to tell you that we have the G7 
cooperation. Now, the G7 cooperation has proved over the past years that we were understanding that we had to cooperate actively, as we said uh, during the last uh, period of time. Uh, the, in Washington, we had uh, such a meeting and we mentioned the fact that we continue to cooperate actively on, uh, uh, in this field. So again, I consider we are in a universe where there is nothing to be expected uh, in this relationship which would challenge one particular currency uh, be uh, uh, a dramatic change for the uh, policies that are pursued in another uh, ensemble. Again, the euro is not, is not challenging any currency. The euro has been created only to permit the European to be in the best collective position possible to run active and uh, productive economy and to counter unemployment, which is, as I said, for a number of reasons, including structural impediments, our main problem today. Yes, speak loudly. Yes, uh, you just asked yourself the question, and you didn't answer it. Uh, you're sitting in the middle of the Bank of France. At this moment, you have an 11% unemployment rate, if not more at this point today. You have one in four young people under 25 unemployed. Give me or give us a scenario about how the euro will indeed affect the problem of unemployment. And how soon, what happens if it's not soon enough? First of all, um, the problem of unemployment in Europe is unfortunately shared by all, or practically all. You quoted the case of my country. If you go to Germany, you have exactly the same order of magnitude, unfortunately, of unemployment. If you cross the border with Italy, you have even a little more unemployment. If you cross the border with Spain, you have even more unemployment. So again, the problem I see is that we have structural impediments that explain that unemployment. Part, a large part of that unemployment is perhaps associated with the decisions that are made by the people themselves, which are caring for security and protection, and maybe it has a certain cost in terms of job creation. Only the people in a democracy can say where they draw the line between security and protection and job creation. They have to say. And my understanding is only that uh, they are not necessarily fully informed of the fact that there is some kind of offsetting and that if you insist too much on one part of your endeavor, you might pay a certain cost on the other one, which is also true when you are uh, going, I would say, uh, to a very active job creation process to the cost of a certain absence of security and protection. So we have to be very cautious. There is no easy answer. And my opinion is that it is crucially a political answer, an answer of the people themselves. But as I said, I think that the euro will help. And the euro, in my opinion, will help because first of all, it will help the economy in general to be more productive, more efficient through a, a better functioning of markets of goods, services, and of capital market. And that per se, of course, will create growth and will create jobs. And second, I trust to the extent that I consider that structural impediments are the main problem in France, in Germany, in Italy, in Spain, not to speak of other countries, I trust that cost fertilization will help to improve the structural environment and therefore create jobs through those structural reforms. I don't say that it will be easy. I don't say that it will, uh, it will uh, I would say, uh, proceed very rapidly from scratch, but I think that it goes in the right direction. Uh, but to conclude on the euro, euro or not euro, 
we would have to continue to practice sound monetary policy. Euro or not Euro, we'll have to continue to practice sound fiscal policies. And Euro or not Euro, we have to embark into structural reforms. So again, let's be cautious. Let's not consider that uh, uh, we are inventing new concepts because the euro is there. All what has been done by the European to converge was considered by, in my opinion, all central banks and I think also all governments are being done over the last five years, for instance, for the sake of the nations concerned and also because it would help the European proceeding towards the European Monetary Union without contradiction. But I repeat, Euro or not Euro, we have to do the structural reforms that are needed. In the back. With all the financial turmoil in the world, I can't resist asking you whether you have any thoughts or suggestions beyond the European Union as to what, what might be done to ameliorate some of the problems that we're all facing there is no indiscreet question, only indiscreet answers. Uh, I would say that, uh, in my opinion, and I think that there is a large consensus on this particular point, we have areas where we could improve the situation and create conditions for uh, less turmoils. Uh, not only the short run, but also in the medium and long run, of course. One is more transparency. More transparency, not only in the field of the authorities and of central banks the world over, and of governments the world over, but also uh, more transparency in the field of market participants and uh, private institutions. And I uh, cannot help uh, saying that it seems to me that it should expand up to the hedge funds themselves. Disclosure, transparency should be the rule of the game for all market participants in order for the market itself to be better informed. A second uh, element of improvement of the global situation would certainly be and it is a, there is a consensus on that, the globalization of the so-called 25 core principles for appropriate uh, behavior in the banking sector. Uh, the Basel Committee of uh, the G10 central banks has worked out in close connection with emerging countries and countries in transition a set of uh, principles that has to be generalized, that has to be globalized, and uh, to the extent that we have discovered or rediscovered in the case of Asia, that it was absolutely clear that a lot of problems were coming from the weakness of the banking sector. Uh, we did not wait for Asia uh, to, uh, to have a lot of problems to start this globalization. It, was, it started in 95, but we have to proceed very rapidly in this direction. Another element, another area where we have a consensus and uh, where we could improve, in my opinion, the global environment much uh, considerably is this area of codes of conduct codes of good practices that could be generalized also in all areas, including governments, including, I would say, macro policies, including financial uh, macro policies, and uh, in particular, uh, not borrowing a certain part of your GDP in foreign currency <clears throat> on a short-term basis, uh, not embarking into policies that would uh, uh, trigger uh, big current account deficits and so forth and so forth. And also, also true, of course, for the private sector as well as the public sector. These three areas are areas of consensus and we have to work very, very actively to permit uh, the, environment, the global environment to be much better. There are other areas, of course, which are of great importance. It was extremely important for uh, the United States uh, to confirm uh, 
that they would uh, accept the quota increase of the IMF because we need the IMF and we need the, the help of the IMF. It was extremely important too that all countries would consider appropriate to make the private sector participate in the rescue operation where they are needed and this is something which uh, it seems to me is also part of the global consensus now. So again a lot a lot of elements are encouraging even if we are living in a very very uh, uh, demanding world in all respect uh, i am reasonably confident that after those meetings in washington we will overcome progressively the difficulty in which we are one of the major difficulty the uh, authorities in general are encountering is the herd instinct of markets. The herd instincts of those who are taking decisions. Uh, they have demonstrated that they could generalize fear in their constituency and organize not, I would say, because it was a will of one or several of them, but because it was a collective behavior, flight to quality, flight to safety. And these flights, when they are the demonstration of a herd instinct, are dangerous, of course. What the authority could say, what Banque de France in uh, his own domain of responsibility is saying is, Let's be as transparent as possible. Let's have full disclosure of all, as I said. Let's not be guided by the herd instinct. Let's look at the real quality of the various signatures. Some are no good. Some are good. Don't put all signatures in the same basket because they would be uh, Asian signatures or uh, Latin America signatures or emerging market signatures or uh, uh, stocks uh, in the industrialized world signatures and so forth. That's not the way to operate. You are informed, you have to distinguish between the various signatures. Let's keep our heads on our shoulders. Let's analyze risks, not in a herd way. Let's analyze risk in a logic, in a coherent, in a responsible way. That's one of the messages we certainly have to launch. And it seems to me that more and more market participants accept that this is the good way of looking at uh, collective behavior in the present uh, juncture. You have to speak up. I'm going from the Fletcher School of Law and Diplomacy, which is nearby, and I wanted to ask you something about your political vision of Europe. Since we cannot distinguish the economic <coughs> dynamics of the European construction to the, from the political one, and in four years from now, supposedly, you're going to have a, perhaps a responsibility which is as much, if not more important, than the President of the European Commission as Chairman of the ECB. So how do you see the future of the uh, political Europe? Do you think this is going to be uh, a federal uh, construction, a federation of the European states, or do you th see it uh, otherwise? as a possibly chairman of the, of the central bank of this new entity? Well, first of all, I am governor of Banque de France. <laughs> and second, I'm citizen. And the question is asked really to the citizen, because you are asking how the citizen sees the evolution of Europe. As a citizen, I would say, I really don't know what is likely to be the evolution of Europe. As far as institutional framework is concerned. I have a strong conviction as far as the direction of Europe. It seems to me that Europe is going to more and more intense cooperation in all fields between Europeans. Whether it will go through a federal government, federal institutions, a federal parliament, uh, or through intensification 
of the present institutional framework, which gives a lot of weight to the college of governments that are responsible at the level of heads of state and government, the council of heads, at the level of governments themselves, the council of ministers, but which give also a lot of weight to the commission to prepare the decision and which gives a lot of weight to the parliament to introduce democracy uh, and uh, representative democracy in the system uh, has to be seen. My understanding is that we could go through the two ways and I am not absolutely convinced that there is a way which would be a dead end because we are today embarking on a single currency which is an extraordinary endeavor we are today embarking into very close cooperation and coordination as regards fiscal policies. And after all, fiscal policies are at the heart of democracies. Parliaments were invented to accept the payment of taxes. And that is the birth of democracy. In that particular area, the Europeans have accepted to cooperate intensely. So it seems to me that through the present institution, of course, amended, improved, we can also proceed and go very far. If we would go as far as we are going in the economic and monetary union, in the other elements, uh, including political elements in Europe, uh, maybe you could see that the Europe is going very, very far away through the pre with the present institutional framework. So we have to be cautious, not consider, in my opinion, that there is any privileged evolution as far as institutions are concerned. What is absolutely true is that Europe is proceeding and probably Europe is proceeding faster than it is understood uh, from the exterior, if I may. Yes. I'd like to come back to the unemployment question because I think that's one of uh, the most, uh, one of the highest priorities in Europe. I do share your opinion that uh, the euro might have high potential for growth in the economies, but uh, unemployment is a predominant question and problem to solve by most of the European leaders. If I look at some of the European countries and their inability to have flexible wages, my major question is if you have inflexibility in the wages and now a, a tendency to have a, a higher mobility of labor in Europe, the euro is going to bring a higher transparency in Europe about how big the differences are, for example, in Central Europe and Southern Europe. Um, I would assume that there's going to be a, a, a quite a big of movement of labor from Southern Europe or the uh, periphery of Europe to the central European countries that have extremely high labor costs because people just want to make more money if they know they can make a lot more money. I would like to know where you derive your optimism from that Europe is going to be able to handle the situation appropriately if you're relying on the rationale of the political leaders that in long term the euro is going to be beneficial or if you can see some mechanism that can help politicians short term to handle that problem. And the problem I see is that unemployment might raise because at least in certain areas of, uh, of Europe because of people coming to the countries with higher wages. It's a very complex problem and again I'm not sure that it is to be fully associated with the euro itself. For instance, take Italy. You have in Italy a lot of unemployed people in the south of Italy. And you have no unemployment in the north of Italy. And of course, in the north of Italy, wages and salaries are correct. Why is there an average unemployment in Italy which is as high, as I said, as in Germany or in France, with this enormous difference in a country which has the same currency, the same language, the same people, the same culture. And the same in France, with uh, uh, areas where you have no unemployment and areas where you have high unemployment. And the same in Germany, where you have relatively low unemployment in the western part of Germany and very high unemployment in the eastern part of Germany. So you see, where is the euro there? 
Where is the euro there? You have, and we have, as I said, a decision which is made by the people themselves, because the people decide in a democracy. And they have decided that for the sake of social protection, for the sake of security, they had to permit uh, a high level of protection in the east of Germany, in the south of Italy, in those areas in France where I said that we had a very high level of unemployment. And the problem we have again at the level of each of our nation and at the level of the euro area as a whole, but the, the heart of the problem is each of, the, of our nation, where do you draw the line between active job creation and these elements of the structural environment. Uh, again, it's a very easy question to respond, of course, from the economic standpoint, where you consider that the goal is job active and buoyant job creation. But the response is not to be given only through an economic reasoning. It has to be given by the people of the democracy. And uh, what we can see is that Obviously, in the US, the response is not the same as in Europe, with you know, assets and liabilities on both sides. I, again, trust that through the intense maturing of the position of each particular nation, to the extent that unemployment is really the main problem, and through the, what I called, cross-fertilization in Europe in general, we will improve the situation in each of our nations and therefore also, of course, improve the situation at the level of the euro area. In a way, you said uh, there will be a lot of, if I understand, labor mobility uh, going in the high wages and salaries area and creating a lot of unemployment in those areas. Another reading of the situation would be to say, uh, on the contrary, there is no labor mobility, and that absence of labor mobility, even in Italy, in Germany, in France, is causing those large areas where you have high uh, unemployment. So in a way, if the, the, the labor was more mobile, we would solve part of the problem. So it will not create a problem, it will on the contrary solve part of the problem. But again, I insist on that. It seems to me that that problem is true at the level of each particular nation, as is clearly demonstrated by observations and figures. Uh, Governor Trichet, I have a rather personal question. Uh, from one of my French friends, I heard that ENA graduates are a de facto ruling class of today's France. And my question is, as the European Monetary Union proceeds and economic integration intensifies, would this tradition continue? <laughs> I don't want to be uh, too uh, qui pro quo, but I've heard, and maybe I'm totally wrong, that a lot of business leaders, political men in the US were coming from Harvard University. <laughs> and maybe, maybe a very meager number of other universities, maybe a little bit MIT, maybe, maybe Yale, Princeton. Uh, brief, uh, to sum it up, uh, you have, and you are yourself, if I understand, a student in a university which is supposed to be an elite university, and uh, is happy to claim that it is an elite university. <laughs> so uh, there are a number of schools uh, in my own country. Uh, they are not ruling the country. I wouldn't say that. Uh, you have the ENA, you have uh, Ecole Polytechnique, you have Ecole des Mines, you have uh, uh, Ecole Normale, and so forth. And you have a number, fortunately, a number of uh, uh, universities or equivalent of the universities. We don't have exactly the same uh, uh, structure, uh, which m we will see how it will, it will evolve, of course. We, we have also the Sorbonne, which is uh, feeding a lot of uh, uh, influential person. Uh, we are living everywhere in a competitive world, and uh, nobody can say that because he's graduated of Harvard or ANA, he's uh, deemed to have the most important jobs. Uh, we have to prove permanently, and that is true today, and it will be more true if I may to more. That's absolutely sure. Professor Hall? Uh, can I ask you about um, the political 
political pressures that uh, the monetary union will face. Uh, thinking about the differences between the world we live in today and the world we'll live in in two years from now in Europe. Um, a few years from now, monetary policy will be um, controlled by the European Central Bank, and fiscal policy will also be coordinated at the European levels. Uh, and one can see how that works in administrative terms. Political terms, though, it means that the European Union, which has always complained about its political obscurity, will now enjoy and suffer from intense political attention. It will, in some sense, be the object of praise or more likely blame for the course of the European economy. And I wonder if you could uh, reflect a little on what that might call for in terms of institution building. Um, the uh, European level. Uh, you spoke to this in very general terms, but I wonder whether you think that ECOFIN, the arrangements currently in place uh, to handle the coordination of fiscal policy, uh, will be adequate to deal with uh, the political pressure, or whether there will uh, likely have to be further institution building uh, and uh, some adjustment perhaps in the relationship between the political authorities at the European level and the As I said, we, we have a present institutional framework which uh, has proved that it was quite efficient over the last years, but you're absolutely right, the powers that are given in particular to the ECOFIN or that are given to those who are voting in the ECOFIN when sanctions, possible sanctions on the bad behavior in the fiscal area are concerned. This, of course, that is a way of mentioning the Euro 11. That, of course, is new. And uh, I would say we are to see exactly how the college will be up to the very heavy responsibility that have been given, and particularly that responsibility of coordinating the fiscal policies at the level of Europe. As I said, I am a pragmatic as regards institution. I don't call as a citizen for any particular change that would be deemed, uh, in my opinion, uh, appropriate. Uh, I would applaud any, any improvement in the institutional framework. I think that uh, to the extent that coordination and cooperation is really the rule of the game, not only in the fiscal side, but in all elements of economic policy, it seems to me that all what can improve the present institutional framework is good. My understanding of the group dynamic inside the college of the 11 or the college of the 15, which is being given a fantastic might by the Maastricht Treaty, I think that to be up to these responsibilities, the group dynamic will create a collegial uh, sentiment, if I may, that the governments in this respect will appear much more united and sticking to their collective decision. So that the Minister of Finance of Europe will be the college of the ministers of finance that are participating in the European Union and in the Euro area. Uh, I draw from your question that you are a little bit skeptic, skeptical on, on the possibility of uh, having this uh, collegial uh, functioning uh, as appropriately as possible. I don't want myself to be too optimistic a priori, but what I trust is that the stakes are so high that if it appears that it is difficult for the college to operate really as the Minister of Finance of Europe, then some kind of new proposal will be made and that we will cope with that particular problem. But I think it would not be fair to say a priori that college will not function as properly as we think. Uh, we have to, to make the working assumption that it will function well, and it is my trust. Use the uh, microphone.
Uh, well, let's let the, you, you can go first and we'll let the woman next to you do a second. Yeah, it's just a short personal question. In the year 2005, who will be president of the European Central Bank? Well, I have nothing to add to the decision which was made by the heads of states and government. <laughs> yes. Um, about the German election outcome, how do you think that this will affect the balance of power in uh, Europe and uh, especially the financial future since uh, Mr. Schroeder has amongst his first priorities not to, to see that Germany should be uh, the rich uncle of Europe? Well, it is not customary to uh, comment on uh, uh, other governments uh, in, uh, in Europe and uh, I must confess I was not expecting so many political questions. <laughs> My understanding was that I was a, a central banker and I expected a lot of very indiscreet questions on our interest rate policy. <laughs> and you know the usual response of uh, Alan Greenspan in uh, appropriate uh, times uh, when he's asked such questions, he makes a response of uh, half an hour, which is a very, very elaborate one on information technology, the change, uh, changes of the household behavior, the uh, monitoring of inventories and the cycle which is not behind. And when he has finished, uh, then I was told, but under your control again, Dean, uh, he was uh, told by a senator, thank you very much, Mr. Chairman. I understand that you will do this or that, I mean, decrease or increase rates or whatever. And then Alan said, very blank and pale, he said, Senator, if you think you have understood what I just said, I probably made a mistake somewhere. <laughs> You spoke about the finance ministers as representatives of the people, but what about central bankers as representatives of the people? Do you side with those who think that the uh, governors of the European Central Bank should be uh, turned this way so people can hear the question? Do you side with those who think that the governors of the European Central Bank should be relatively insulated, should stay out of the public sphere, as some Germans have, have argued, or do you believe that they should be essential conduits to the public, explaining the policy, acting more as representatives and advocates, and if so, do you worry that the latter course uh, would lead to more public control or scrutiny that would be unwelcome over the central bank? Uh, I think that the central bank, an independent central bank, is of course in relation, in close relation with the executive branch, with the parliament, uh, with uh, uh, the commission, if any, and we have in France exactly the same kind of relationship between the independent central bank and the government, the parliament, that exists at the level of Europe between the European central bank and the European parliament, the Commission and the President of the Council, which is the, ex the equivalent of the executive branch at the level of Europe. But to the extent that the central bank is independent, it has to explain, of course, what the college is doing, what policy is implemented, why, and it has to explain that to, I would say, the public opinion itself. Uh, and there is absolutely no disagreement on that particular point between colleagues. And uh, you mentioned another country. I can tell you we totally agree on the fact that it is part of the independent central bank uh, institutional framework to be responsible, as responsible as possible, vis-à-vis -vis the public opinion, explain and have a good understanding of the understanding of the public opinion itself. The ultimate responsibility of an independent central bank is to be responsible before the public opinion. I will take the example of France. You probably have read papers and uh, you probably have in mind that uh, there was some questions and a very lively debate in France during the last five years. We made polls to see exactly if our message on the interest of stability of the currency, of solidity of the currency, of appropriately low inflation was understood or not by the public opinion. And I can tell you that approximately 70% of the French people were backing the so-called uh, Frankfurt policy you were mentioning, uh, Dean. Uh, so uh, we know 
that the support of public opinion is extremely important, of course, in a democracy, which is also an opinion democracy, and the explanation, not only publicly ex cathedra, but also to all opinion leaders of all sensitivities of on a multi-partisan basis is absolutely of the essence. It is our understanding that an independent central bank, again, has to explain openly and uh, informally to all sensitivities the reason why it is doing this and that. It will be done at the level of the European Central Bank by the European Central Bank itself in relationship with the institution of Europe and at the level of each national central banks through the national framework. It is very important to understand that what we are building is a system of central banks. We call it the ESCB, the European System of Central Banks. And to explain the policy of the system, which will be decided by the border governor of the ECB in country X, you have to rely heavily on the skill, the language, and the knowledge of the NCB, the National Central Bank of country X. And the wealth, as I said, we are not starting from scratch. We have the legacy of all national central banks, which is absolutely key to be sure that the monetary policy is deeply rooted in each particular nation member of the euro area. This will have to be the last question. Uh, there's been a lot of anticipation uh, with the coming of the euro of a large unified uh, euro-denominated securities market that uh, might at some point rival the United States uh, securities market. I'm wondering how you think this will develop in the absence of a uh, large unified federal treasuries market such as we have here in the U.S. Well, we will see how this uh, is moving, of course. Uh, as you said, we have a single currency, but we don't have a single signature. They are national signature, and the market itself, in my opinion, will uh, see what is the best way to have as deep, profound, and liquid markets possible, without the idea of being the rival to the U.S., but with the idea of organizing the best fashion possible our own markets in Europe. We will see what happens. The, the question you are posing is one of the most pertinent we can pose, and uh, we will see exactly which response is given. It, what is true is that you cannot merge merge the signature a priori, uh, because the nation states remain and the, the various budgets remain. But maybe there are ways to get the same level of liquidity uh, with various signatures. Well, Mr. Trichet confessed to me that this is his first visit to Harvard University, and we hope that we have persuaded him that it should not be the last, but one of many. We are very grateful for you to take this time from your busy schedule between the bank and fund meetings and your return to France. And we hope now that you know that Boston is on a direct route between Washington and Paris, we will see you many times again.